Chintan Patel ji is basically a chartered accountant who practiced as a senior partner of Naresh J. Patel and Company at Ahmedabad. He is also a regional council member uh, of the WIRC of ICI and uh, uh, is also expert on uh, Indian accounting standards as well as IFRS. He does a lot of consultancy on IFRS as well as he has various uh, assignments to uh, uh, outside India also where he basically works as a KPO in Ahmedabad and Chintan and me have written a book also on uh, Indian accounting standards and somehow a uh, revival of that book is pending on my part. Uh, also we have authored one of the article on business combination. I, I remember on business combination we have written article uh, in the CA journal. So with this, uh, I would like that uh, as a keynote to speaker, uh, Chintan, uh, please address the entire audience on the consolidated finance statements. And thereafter, we have our speakers, uh, Har Smithy, Puri Kathod, and Chitrans. All three speakers have prepared themselves. Uh, so, in fact, uh, our model of the Saturday class is basically keynote speaker has to set the tone and thereafter uh, the other speakers uh, take it forward and depending on the availability of the keynote speakers because it is the virtual uh, attendance by you uh, you may continue to join as well as according to your wish you can uh, you can actually quit from the class also so there is no compulsion on the keynote speaker to <laughs> to remain uh, full time in the class so that liberty one can take. So, Chintan Bhai, over to you. Yes, Bhubendra Bhai, uh, thank you so much. Can I, can I look at the Bhubendra Bhai over the team? Can you just uh, change the camera to all of you? Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Yeah, I think the first of all, let me congratulate your uh, principal and the moderator plus the firm uh, Bhubendra Bhai and also Kalanini company for having this kind of wonderful initiative for training of article students. Because very few firms in India uh, really take care of the articles which includes Kalanini company. Uh, training is the most important part of any CF firm and that's why it should be done in the most important spirit. Bhubendra Bhai has shared my profile and he also mentioned about a few things which we have done together. And I still remember and cherish the memories which I have spent in person when I was there at the office where you are sitting there. Because with Kalan company, two things which we have done together, one includes the authoring on the book of Peak Gut Windows published by Textman. And second is on uh, having a joint, a joint article with Bhubendra Bhai on business combination. The prayer which you started and Bhubendra Bhai, I re remember still uh, maybe 10 years back when we 
uh, when we were there, when we were there at Kalanin Company, the prayer was there before we start India training program. And I'm proud to say that uh, maybe for the first time to you that the same kind of prayer we are also doing in, a, in our office every week. So the prayer is different. However, every Monday morning we have also prayer in our office where all staff articles uh, come together. And that particular idea, inspiration, I I, I took from the Kalanin Company. Now taking further here, let me just brief you about uh, the, this particular topic. I, I can see very young, energetic article students sitting here who got opportunity to go through the implementation guide of ICI. And somebody who has gone through the implementation guide, I think that is one of the very important piece of material which anybody can get. So uh, first of all, my compliments to all of you and a uh, very, very important thing is to uh, the Harsh, uh, Harsh Methi, Purvi Khator and Chitran Vijay, who three take the challenge to really uh, take this topic on hand. Why I'm saying challenge? Because probably you may not have opportunity to go through or apply these in the practice. However, this is something which cannot be ignored. Consultative financial statements was before India's come to picture, it was just a thing which may be required in certain XYZ cases. However, no one has spent so much, so much time to really understand go to detail. But if you just look at if you just look at the review of last few fraud scam happen in India, if, even if you look at how the CB, NAFRA, RBI, and governments look at the any particular company, they give more importance to the consolidated financial statements. They will more they give they give more importance to the group as a whole rather than a standard financial statements. So earlier the objective was primarily on the financial performance of a particular company. However, now this has been uh, more taken into spirit as a group performance. What was striking important difference which I request uh, the speakers to also touch upon and I'm sure that they must to touch upon is to have a deliberation on the definition of control. Control is a, a very, very critical and important aspects of India 110. If you just look at India 110, the number of pages which has been consumed by India 110 and out of that particular pages, around more than 40% or 50% pages are only for one explanation of control definition. So 50% focus is on control definition and 50% focus was on doing and uh, consolidation, then disclosures, intercom the animations. That is the 50%. That only itself suggests that how important the definition of control is. If I share my experience and maybe the Bhubendra may also uh, share the experience of when we converge from AS to India AS, at that time, one of the most critical aspects for any group for doing India's convergence was looking at the control aspect. <laughs> for example, if certain company may be a subsidiary under AS, it may be associated under India AS. Something which may, is a joint venture, it may be a subsidiary, subsidiary may be joint venture and associate may become a subsidiary. So that kind of change happen when we move from AS to India AS. and every this change has a huge implications on the group. The management of a company, also the stakeholders of the company are impacted by way of this particular consolidation. Sometimes you may be surprised that why so much you are crying on consolidation, what is to be consolidated, what is to not to be consolidated. I think one of the most important striking difference when you move from AS to India AS is a definition control. We always believe that what is the difference between AS and India AS? It is generally mentioned that AS is a rule base, India AS is a principle base. If you ask a question, how India AS and AS are different, how AS and India are different, what is the difference between principle and rule? So one example which can be easily given 
is of AS21 and Indus 110. When you just look at about AS21 and Indus 110, I think in that aspect you will understand that under AS21 control or a subsidiary for that button is defined to have a very, very simple rule. If you have more than 50%, then that becomes a subsidiary. If it is less than 50%, it becomes associates. So as a management, I have liberty to choose whether I want to do concentration subsidiary or I want to do as an associate. So that is what the liberty, so where the rule is there, it is subject to change as far as the management is concerned. However, when you just look at the NDS, in that case, it provides you the principle. So under AS, it's possible to have uh, two parents for one child. Right? So basically, a company, XYZ company can say that ABC is my subsidiary. Same way PQR parent can also say ABC is my subsidiary. So there can be two parents for one subsidiary. It's possible under India, under AS. However, under India, it is more principal. It's just driving you and providing you the guidelines for the control definitions. So principally, it is not possible as far as India is concerned. So uh, control definition is one of the very important part, which I'm sure that uh, your speakers, which have been there, they are going to deal on these particular aspects. And uh, maybe Bhupendra Bhai uh, has also very good experience on uh, India's implementation where we identified so many cases where uh, this kind of change has happened. And that experience blending will really make a lot of difference as far as uh, that part is concerned. Now taking the second very important part that is on uh, basically compulsory or not. Being a practicing CA and Bhupendra Bhai, we all got a lot of questions from a practicing CAs and others. Is a consortium compulsory? So it is governed by companies at 2013. And then another question will come in picture that if I have only associate and no subsidiary, then the consultation is compulsory or not. So I think that is something where you also deliberate within your, so I'm not providing complete answer to a lot of questions, but my object is to really uh, instigate that what a lot, this particular topic has huge potential for all of you to have an interesting discussion. So uh, what is, when council is compulsory, when it is not compulsory, that can be also one point which can be deliberated here. And uh, as I discussed that, there's a lot of focus on either the subsidiary, associate or joint venture. So that has to be a deliberation on particular part that if you consult as a subsidiary or as an associate as a joint venture, how your financial changes and which particular part of considering some company as associate or considering that, that same company as subsidiary or joint ventures can really benefit a company or can impact the company. From top government point of view, whether a subsidiary should be beneficial or associate or joint venture and under any which circumstances it should be done or not to be done, that can also be our point which can be deliberated. Uh, because uh, it is a really a practical situation and a lot of top management of corporates are uh, uh, keenly observing that how their group is being presented and how their profitability is being presented, how the top line is changed, how the bottom line is changed, and how it's being done. So that is, uh, is one thing which can be done. Third very important point which I would like to address here is that about intercompany elimination. One of the very important part is on related party disclosures. If there is a, if there is a standalone company, under standalone company, you also have to check about the disclosures of related party transitions. But when you move to consolidated, at the time, you just look at elimination of intercompany transactions. So uh, the most crucial part for any fraud which has happened is of siphoning of fraud generally happens through RPT transactions. And even if we talk about the past situation where the fund has been moved from company A to company B, company B to company C, and then out of India, they have been done very easily and simply by way of a corporate wheel, a corporate structure, and it has been done. So the real intercompany animation 
is one of the very very important part so your discussion on line by line consolidation and if you are able to have a excel based understanding of if, if anybody is to provide us a brief overview of how line by line consolidation happens that is a very, very important part but before you call to consolidation very critical part is to you to read through the accounting policy for consolidation what are today we are discussing and if you really want to understand the heart of any accounting issues the best way is to read annual report for annual report maybe you can take a uh, 5 minutes for anybody to go through the annual report of any of the listed company and in a consolidated financial statement under accounting policy second point in accounting policy is always on the consolidation method of consolidation and in the method of consolidation there are two to three paragraphs are written and at this three paragraph is a heart of india standard tax it talks about how consolidation is being done it talks about uniform accounting policy it talks about the briefly the key principles which are underlying the consolidation of financial statements so you can also go through the any of the company financial statements and look at understand the how consolidation is being done very next important point is also on uh, goodwill because uh, if the time permits you also have a deliberation on goodwill goodwill how goodwill arises goodwill may arises on consolidation goodwill may arise on business combination so in which situation the goodwill arises in the books of standard financial statements and in which situation goodwill arises in the books of consolidated financial statements and how the goodwill in consolidated financial statements is being measured and in case of sale of subsidiary what should be done to the changes in equity so these are the few points which i feel that are uh, crucial but yes sometimes i may have deliberated on certain te technical complex issue but the most important point at this juncture is that you have to start start with the understanding of the principles and that can best happen when you go through the ici guidance note improvement guide on this particular topic and uh, once again not taking term much time further because i can see that there are three speakers and who are ready to really uh, give their uh, learning they must spend a lot of days and times to ensure that uh, this particular recorded video has been seen appropriately so uh, my best of luck to all of you uh, and uh, the three speakers in person i'm sure that uh, they will really be able to enlighten with a lot of important knowledge it is going to be useful to each one of you and uh, my thank you to ca bhubendra mantri uh, for uh, inviting me here for sharing my brief words and bhubendra bhai anywhere anytime if you have any questions anything which you are required i am always available it's always a pleasure to be associated with you at the firm over to bhubendra bhai yeah uh, thank you chandan bhai in fact uh, you have given the uh, entire food for thought as well as uh, various issues for discussion to our team and i am sure they have certainly prepared on all these aspects whether it is related to the control whether uh, which entity is required to be consolidated or which entity is not uh, is not required to be consolidated how how one has to deal with the inter company uh, transactions and uh, how these are required to be eliminated how the use of excel or any other Uh, software can be relevant for the purpose of uh, such uh, elimination of the intercompany transactions and you also discuss about the accounting policies that uh, how relevant they are and how one can see from the annual reports of various companies uh, for the purpose of ascertaining that what exact practices are there for the purpose of consolidation you mentioned about the goodwill also Uh, that how this is required to be dealt with, and uh, I am sure that uh, our speakers have also uh, prepared on all these aspects in detail, and they will be discussing uh, most of these aspects in detail through the educational material which has been issued by the ICI. So with this, 
uh, I am really thankful for accepting my invite to be there in the uh, Saturday class. And uh, in fact, uh, by having presence of a speaker like you, uh, uh, the uh, the repute of this class is also increasing day by day because uh, every week when we invite some or the other speaker from outside who is again a person of professional repute uh, it give an added advantage to this class also this webinar also so thank you so much and uh, we would like that uh, you hear these students according to your convenience thank you so much Bhavendra bhai i may have to leave for some other meeting but we will be in touch not an issue not an issue Yes. Okay. Thank you. Bye. So now our speaker will uh, deal with the subject on consolidated financial statements. So, जब तक ये अपना setup करें, आपको क्या समझ में आ रहा है कि आज हम क्या discuss करेंगे consolidated financial statements? Hmm? आपके पहले इंटर में था ये इंटरमीडिएट में एज ट्वेंटी वन होगा चैप्टर वाइज बट बट उसमें उन्होंने एज ट्वेंटी वन को डील किया होगा क्योंकि इंडेज आपके सब्जेक्ट्स में नहीं थे यहाँ पे हम इंडेज वन वन जीरो डिस्कस करेंगे सो देर आर सम डिफरेंसेस इन टर्म ऑफ मतलब इन टर्म्स ऑफ प्रिंसिपल ऑल्सो एज इंटर वाइज अबाउट that uh, the definition of control is uh, different as compared to the definition of control in accounting standards so is tarike ke kai sare differences hain so let him uh, discuss uh, the days 110 wherever required i will try to a very good afternoon everyone so hope you are good hope you are fine and doing well so now today in today's saturday class we are going to discuss about index 110 that is consolidated financial statements so before starting the technical part of our presentation let us quickly have a glimpse of the topic that we going to make a part of this presentation so we talk about consolidation i briefly divided the presentation into three major parts first the objective and scope of the index 110 second the concept of control and power then the concept of rights and returns which will be covered by me then concept of deemed power accounting requirements and consolidation procedure which will be covered by pooji and then concept of non controlling interest and uniform accounting policies and investment entities to be covered by chitranj so before we go to the depth of the presentation let me ask you a few questions in a practical life they are not related to consolidation so relax you don't need to worry much about it so how many of you have solved jigsaw puzzles in your childhood all of you have solved so when you solve when talk about solving jigsaw puzzles so assume that if i give you a jigsaw puzzle what will the steps you take to solve that puzzle right from beginning till the end take an overview of the jigsaw puzzle and imagine what would be the final look of the jigsaw puzzle and then you will try to solve it by trial and error so can i summarize the whole procedure of solving the jigsaw puzzle into three major steps first step is to get all the unsolved pieces of the puzzle together So if we talk about first of all, I will open the box. I will take all the pieces out. That is the first step. Second, I will try to solve the puzzle so by trying to putting, but I am putting all the pieces together. Now third and the most major part. What will I do if I am not able to find the correct place for a piece in the puzzle? So trial is a different thing. That is then that is the step two. You are trying to put the pieces together, but if you are not able to find a correct place for a piece. What will you do then? Okay, so let me help you. So, you know, when we talk about solving this puzzle, so should there was a pamphlet, a photo was provided in the box, but how will the final puzzle will look like when once it is solved? It was there. So, which we have to refer this in this case. So, whenever you used to get stuck while solving, you have to take a look at the picture. and find the appropriate place for the piece so now keeping this whole procedure in mind let us start with the presentation <coughs> definition of consolidated financial statements financial statements of group asset liabilities equity income 
expense and cash flow of the subsidiary and parent presented as those of a single economic entity so can i say financial statements of a group comprise of jigsaw puzzle and all the elements like asset liabilities equity income and expense cash flow are the elements of that puzzle that are put together to give me a final picture of consolidated financial statement would look like a single economic entity now this is this only covers step two steps from my three steps that i have explained to you at first i will take all the pieces together that is first i will get all the straight financial single assignable financial statements of the entity together that is asset liabilities income and expenses of all the stand alone financial statement second i will try to put all the pieces together that is i will try to consolidate all the component of the financial statements together but third and the most major part what will i do if i get stuck while doing the consolidation process there you have to there you should have the picture uh, step 3 that was provided in your box now obviously we don't have a photo but we have a indian accounting standards that will help us to consolidate in the, in case we get stuck while doing it so when we talk about we have indias to help us consolidate and let us look for brief overview that which indias will help us where we are talk about consolidation financial statements the major six indias that are prescribed by the ministry of corporate affairs deal with consolidation now you can have only you can see only five there but that is a deliberate uh, deliberate deliberately so when talk about indias 110 it is the basic that from the basis of all the standard that are prescribed for consolidation of financial statements so coming later to indias 110 let us first talk about indias 103 indias 103 talks about business combination that is it is a calculation based indias that indias 110 prescribes both the concept of consolidation like when you have to consolidate when you have not consolidate what are the steps that will major the steps you will take in assessing whether you have to you have a control over the entity or not in this 103 prescribes the whole calculation part that once you are done judging that you have to consolidate with the subsidiary then how you calculate various components that are required for the purpose of consolidation let it be goodwill let it be bpg so here bpg is called business purchase gain but in intermediate it was referred to as capital reserve so in india we have a concept of business purchase gain so here i would like to actually correct you all this indias 103 is basically a business combination accounting where a particular accounting is done on a particular date that is called acquisition date so ye thoda sa isne jo bola usko main support karne ke liye bol raha hu ye standard bar bar kaam nahi aata hai ye ek hi bar kaam aata hai एक ही बार एक ही डेट को काम आता है उसके बाद इस स्टैंडर्ड की रिलायंस नहीं है वो कब काम आता है व्हेन यू हैव परचेज ए पर्टिकुलर बिजनेस आपने कोई रनिंग बिजनेस है उसको आपने परचेज कर लिया तो उस दौरान आपको उसकी जो भी नेट असेट्स आपने अक्वायर करी है उसका फेयर वैल्यू कैसे करना है गुडविल का कैलकुलेशन कैसे करना है जो कंसिडरेशन ट्रांसफर्ड है उसका कैलकुलेशन कैसे करना है ये सब की अकाउंटिंग के थ्रू एज ऑन दैट पर्टिकुलर डेट होती है और जो रेलेवेंट डिस्क्लोजर्स है वो कैसे करने ये 103 में बताया गया है तो एक बार 103 आपने अप्लाई कर दिया तो अगली बार आप उसको जब अप्लाई करोगे जब कोई नया बिजनेस खरीदोगे उसके बाद आपको बार बार 110 में 103 के हिसाब से क्या करना है ये देखने की जरूरत नहीं है हाँ, कुछ चीजें रेलेवेंट है जो हम बाद में डिस्कस करेंगे कि 103 में जो वैल्यूज असेस की है वो वैल्यूज आपके आगे जाके 110 में आगे काम आती है कैसे काम आती है वो अपन डिस्कस करेंगे और 103 का अपन कभी किसी दिन एक अलग से टॉपिक रखेंगे है ना बिकॉज इट इज अगेन फुल डे टॉपिक यू कैन से सो नाउ यू कैन नाउ वे टॉक अबाउट थर्ड इन डेज दैट इज स्टार्ट बाई मिस्टर कॉपेट अफेयर टू डील विदिक ऑफ कंसोलिडेट फाइनेंशियल स्टेटमेंट is in this 28 now in this 28 talks about a very a different concept altogether that is investment in associates and joint ventures so in this 28 gives prescribes a new method called as equity method to in order to consolidate with associates and joint ventures now we talk about in this 111 111 that talks about joint arrangements in what step that you have to follow when you are consolidating with joint arrangements and then we have in this 27 that is separate financial statements of entity preparing consolidated financial statements now we we'll talk about index 27 the index applicable to index 27 is only on those entities that are required to present consolidated financial statement 
So first of all, you have to clear that doubt in your mind that if an entity is not having any subsidiary, so while he is preparing a standalone financial statement, it is not it is or not mandatory for him to follow India's 27. As I say, India's 27 not applies to him. It only applies to an entity that has required to present consolidated financial statements. So a normal entity can prepare these financial statements using various Indian accounting standards, that is India's 116 or XY standards that are prescribed. Now. Let us first look at the objective of the net standard 110. Now, index 110 establishes principle for the presentation and preparation of consolidated financial statements when an entity controls one or more entity. So, the basic motive of index prescribing index 110 is to give you a give you a concept, give you a basis, which will be used to judge whether you have to consolidate with the entity or not. And the concept which index 110 has prescribed is the concept of control. So whenever you have to assess that you have to consolidate or not, kya hua, Kunal, kya ho gaya? you will assess. You will assess by assessing you whether you have control over the entity or not. Now to meet the objective of index one one zero, whether it requires an entity that controls one or more entities that is subsidiaries to present consolidated financial statements. That's a general statement. I think complex. Now, now coming to the major part of index one one zero, index one one zero defines the principle of control. And establishes control as the basis for consolidation. So, this index one hundred and ten says that that as I explained, first of all, you have to judge whether you have control over the entity or not. And if you are having the control of the entity, then you are required to consolidate as per index one one zero and various other index that are prescribed. Third, index one hundred and ten sets out how to apply the principles of control. Determine whether an investor control an investor, therefore must consolidate the investor. Fourth, it sets out accounting requirement for preparation of consolidated financial statements, and fifth, it defines the investment entity and exceptions for consolidation. Now, coming to the scope of index 110, so let me ask you: It is mandatory, as per your knowledge, is concerned from intermediate? Is it mandatory for all the entities that are parent to consolidate? Can you call any exception? इनकॉर्पोरेटरी एक्सेप्शन So not never. Let us have a look at it. So entity that is present, uh, that is parent, is required to present CFS except now first exception. It is the voluntary exception. If it is the wholly owned subsidiary and debt and equity instrument not traded in pub public market. So I would like to emphasize on the end that is highlighted here. That means all the four conditions has to be satisfied. So if it is the wholly owned subsidiary, that means parent owns hundred percent share. In the subsidiary, second, subsidiary's debt and equity instrument should not be traded in the public market. Third, it did not file and not in the process of filing its financial filing any documents for issue of any class of securities, so any debt securities or any equity shares. And now fourth, its ultimate or intermediate parent company produces financial statements that are available for public use and comply with India's. That is, it any if it any parent company. For example, if the chain holding, that means if entity A is having 100% share in entity B, and entity B is having another subsidiary, entity C. So if entity B has to claim the exception, the ultimate subsidiary, that is entity A, has to issue consolidated financial statements. Both the parents, both the parents cannot avail the exception. Second is a mandatory exception that was provided under Index 110 that Index 110 is not applicable to post-employment benefits. Plans other long-term employee benefit plans to which India's 19 and employee benefit applies. 
that is example trust or similar entities that are established for the purpose of pension or gratuity plans so if there is trust or similar entity that is established in this and 90 as in this 19 will apply third it is again a mandatory exception if a parent is a investment company who is required to measure all the subsidy required to measure all the subsidies at fbtpl now how many of you what is fbtpl that means that all the benefit that is accruing from the subsidies will be treated to profit and loss account now there is a star that is here applicable to all the subsidies and joint ventures now if as i mentioned the entity subsidiary should be a wholly owned subsidiary but in this 110 also prescribes an exception to this exception also now and a subsidiary which is not a wholly owned subsidiary can also a claim an exception provided if in addition to all the four conditions prescribed above that is these four conditions that are prescribed all the other shareholders that means all the other shareholders accept the shareholding of the parent so if i am talking about subsidiary or joint venture other than a wholly owned subsidiary so they must be a proportion which to all the other shareholders that we call as a non controlling interest that might be holding so you have to get their permission that we are not presenting the consolidated financial statements and they should not have any objection to that now let us give examples on this topic the first example is a very simple one so any one of you let like us assess and give me a reply online participants also may please reply uh, in the chat box you can repeat the question so now let me do the reading for the question for you to help so there is a in company pqr limited that is having two wholly owned subsidiaries ab limited and bc limited now ab limited and bc limited is having one more subsidiary xyz private limited that is 60% share holding by ab limited and 40% share holding by bc limited now you have to answer me with respect to xyz private limited whether xyz private limited can claim the exception under index 110 or not and if it can claim exception in this 110 what are the condition it has to fulfill to claim the exception So let me give you the answer. So, although XYZ Limited is a partly owned subsidiary of AB Limited, so we can say XYZ subsidiary is a XYZ Private Limited is a partly owned subsidiary of AB Limited. XYZ Limited is a partly owned subsidiary of AB Limited. It is a wholly owned subsidiary of PQR Limited, and therefore satisfies condition 4A1 of Index 110. Now, when we talk about condition 4A1. the condition that data prescribed in the 4a1 are these four conditions so therefore it satisfies the condition 4a1 of index 110 and index 110 without regard to response relationship with the immediate owners that is ab and bc limited that means if we talk about xyz in general it satisfies the condition of being a wholly owned subsidiary of an entity that is pqr limited so don't have to focus much on ab limited and bc limited Now, thus, XYZ Limited being the wholly owned subsidiary. This XYZ Limited being the wholly owned subsidiary. This XYZ Limited being wholly owned subsidiary fulfills the condition as mentioned under Index 110 and is not required to inform its other owners, BC Limited, of its intention not to prepare consolidated financial statement. Now, when we'll talk about this statement that is mentioned, that is not required to inform other owner, that is BC Limited, of its intention not to prepare the consolidated financial. statement that is provided in respect to this star that is mentioned thus in accordance to above xyz limited may take exception under paragraph 4a of index 110 now we we'll talk about another interesting example that is this one so what can i take and mix out of this example again answer me in respect of xyz limited
I request you all not to lay too much emphasis on the word limited. It doesn't mean if the limited is mentioned here, it doesn't mean it is listed entity. Let me make it more simple for you. It is an unlisted entity. Uh, let me give you the answer for this example. In case, in case both AB limited and BC limited are owned by individual Mr. X, then XYZ limited is ultimately wholly in control of Mr. X. So XYZ limited is ultimately wholly in control of Mr. X that is an individual. And hence it cannot be considered as wholly owned subsidiary of an entity. Now, let us read the next point. This is because Indian Entity 10 makes use of term entity. And the word entity includes a company as well as an any other form of entity. Since Mr. X is an individual and not an entity, therefore XYZ Limited cannot be considered as wholly owned subsidiary of an entity. But therefore, in a given case, XYZ Limited is a partially owned subsidiary of another entity. That is, XYZ Limited is a partial subsidiary of AP Limited. Therefore, in order to avoid the exception in the paragraph 4a, its other owner, PC Limited, should be informed about. And do not object to XYZ Limited not presenting the consolidated financial statements. That means if XYZ Limited has to avail the exception under index 110, then it must inform its another owner that is non controlling BC Limited that is not going to prepare consolidated statements. Had it been a wholly owned subsidiary of an entity, then it must not, it is not compulsory for him to comply with this additional condition it is prescribed. But it is as owned by an individual. It is required to comply with the additional requirement that is lying in the index 110. Now, as we have another example on the third exception, third exception regarding to investment entity. So, now again, talk about PQR Limited, it is a non investment entity. Then it has XY Limited, it has a wholly owned subsidiary XYZ Limited, which is an investment entity. XYZ Limited is and then having two more wholly owned subsidiaries, A Limited and B Limited. A Limited is a non investment entity, and B Limited also is a non investment entity. B Limited is a subsidiary of XYZ Limited. A Limited is a subsidiary of XYZ Limited, carrying on services that relate to investment activities of XYZ Limited. Now you have to give an answer to me in respect of XYZ Limited also, in respect of PQR Limited also. One, one answer was correct that PQR Limited is not required to prepare conservative financial statements because they are not investment entity and has nothing to do with the third exception that is provided under index 110. But I will differ on your opinion regarding XYZ Limited. So when you talk about XYZ Limited, let us first go through the portion of PQR Limited. So there are no exceptions under index 110 from presentation of consolidated financial statements to a non investment entity, which is the ultimate parent entity in the group. Further, index 110 provides that a parent of an investment entity shall consolidate all entity that it controls, including those controlled to an investment entity subsidiary unless the parent itself is an investment entity. So there is a concept that parent must be an investment entity. Accordingly, PQR Limited is required to present its consolidated financial statements. So you were right regarding PQR Limited. Now when we talk about perspective of XYZ Limited, it is an investment entity that has two subsidiaries, A Limited and B Limited. Subsidiary A is a non-investment entity which provides services that relate to investment activities undertaken by XYZ Limited. So XYZ Limited is required to consolidate in respect of A Limited and major investment in subsidiary B Limited at FPTPL. Why? Because XYZ Limited is having a subsidiary A Limited that is providing services that is related to operation of XYZ Limited. So when you talk about a subsidiary that is providing services that relate to your services, the purpose of investing in A Limited might not be the only for sole purpose of selling it in future. 
so it is mandatory on x y z limited to consolidate with a limited and it has an option to present b limited at f e p p a now third point since the ultimate parent company of x y z limited it is p q r limited as to present consolidated financial statements mandatory by index index hundred and ten therefore x y z limited is eligible for exemption from presentation of consolidated financial statements under index hundred and ten as it is ultimate parent entity p q r limited produces financial statements that are available for public use and comply with index so can i say here it is referred here it has referred the first exception that was available index hundred and Then that if the ultimate parent company issues consolidated financial statements, then a subsidy is not required to furnish consolidated financial provided it fulfills all other four conditions that are prescribed. So it is fulfilling all the five conditions. It is not required to present consolidated financial statements. Now we we'll talk about concept of control, the most critical part of India's 110. So as objective of India's 110 states that whether you have to con- consolidate an entity or not, it only depends. That whether to control the entity or not. So when we talk about definition of control, so definition of control that is given in the index 110 is given in form of three conditions. So you have to judge three conditions independently and then form conclusion that whether to control the entity or not. So if we talk about first condition that is prescribed and the definition of control is whether the investor has power over the entity. So when we, when we talk about an investor has power over the entity. First, have to understand the concept of power. So we will be dealing with the concept of power in detail. Then, second concept is exposure or rise to variable returns from its involvement within the investing. So, when talk about rise to variable returns, we need to understand the concept of returns. And then, when we call it a variable return, so mainly it is mainly the characteristic that is not constant does not make it a variable return. Or a fixed return. So we'll look into matter in detail. Third condition is its ability to use its power over the investor to affect the amount of investors' return. That means if it is having power, if it is having a variable return, then it must have its ability to use that power to you know influence the variable return it is having out of that entity. So first, let us discuss the concept of power. But before that, few theory on concept of control. So, an investor controls the investor when it is exposed or has rise to variable return from its involvement within the investor, and has the ability to affect those returns through its power over the investor. So, just the, the theoretical the, that definition and equation converted into theory. Second, an investor shall consider all the facts and circumstances when assessing whether it controls the investor. The investor shall reassess whether it controls the investor if facts and circumstances indicate. that there are no changes to one or more of the three elements of control the changes to one or more of three elements listed in this 110 that means when we talk about the concept of control or control assessment you have to do a continuous assessment that if there are in changes in any of the three elements then it might be possible that you no longer control that particular entity third is when two or more investors collectively control an investor they must act together to direct the relevant activities now when two or we have two or more parents or subsidiary then they must act together to direct the relevant activities now what is a relevant activity again we will de- we will tell you in detail in uh, upcoming presentation but just to give you a brief overview about relevant activities the major operations or major activities that affect the return of an entity are considered as relevant activities to that particular business now in such cases business because no investor can direct the activities without the cooperation of other That means if an entity is having two or more owners, you know it individually cannot affect direct the activities without the cooperation of other owners. No investor individually controls the investing. Each investor would account for his interest in the investing according to the relevant index, such as 111. That means if an entity is having two or more investors, then it surely it might not be a fully owned subsidiary or a partly owned subsidiary. It can be associated with a joint venture. So accordingly, we will apply index 111 or index 28. That is joint arrangement or investment associated and venture. That is you can use the equity method to consolidate it. Now then, index 109 also becomes relevant. That is financial instruments. So that in case it is a concept of investment entity, then the whole concept of equity will also come into the game. Now we talk about assessment of control. 
you know, the, the, the index prescribes five major points that you have to check while assessing whether you control the entity or not. So the first point that is prescribed is you have to understand the purpose and design of the investing that you invested in. Second, what are the relevant activities regarding that entity and how the decisions are made regarding that entity. Third is right of the investor to give it the current ability to direct the relevant activity. Now, when what is current ability and what are right? Again, I'm going to tell you in detail in future. So, investors then uh, these two steps are just like just a repetition of the these two that are prescribed in the main definition of control. That is, investors should be exposed or rise to variable returns from the involvement within the investee. And third, investor has the ability to use its power over the investee to affect the amount of investors return. Now, when I talk about first three steps that are addition to the three conditions that are prescribed in the main definition of control. That means, can I say the, this portion has been further divided into three parts? The first part is a purpose and design of the investee. Now, collectively, when you call about the division of further three parts, we can categorize it as whether the entity has power over the other subsidiary or not. So, when you assess whether you have power over subsidiary or not, you have to first assess whether you are fulfilling these three conditions. Then, if you are fulfilling these three conditions, we will come to the other two conditions that are prescribed under the main definition of control. So, now when you talk about power, now tell me when you can say that you have a power over someone, not a subsidiary. When you can say you have power over an identity and the person. Okay. Any other? Give me a general definition not related to consolidation or technical, just a relevant or a daily life example. So when you can say I have a control over this person, if he is sitting, what's the name? When can I say I have a control over? If you are following your directions to perform any Absolutely correct. When I have the ability to influence his activities, I can say that I can have a power over him. So now for the purpose of me assessing whether I have a power over him or not, first of all I have to assess the purpose and design of the investity. That means how the entity is structured. So in order to get power over entity, first of all I have to understand then what are the rights right, that I have to acquire to control an investity or not. So when talk about purpose of design, first of all look at this flowchart. Whether the rising out of contractual agreements. That means, is the entity structured in a way that the major shareholding, that is equity shareholding, has no issue with the relevant activities that the entity is functioning or regarding the decisions that are made regarding the relevant activities that the entity is doing. It might be possible in case the entity has an internal contractual agreement that all the decisions regarding the relevant activities are made by an individual which will be appointed by board of directors and shareholders have nothing to do with the appointment of. And direction of relevant activities. Okay. And the second case is when we have no such contractual agreements, then the power decided on the basis of shareholding. That means whoever will, whoever will having the largest shareholding will power power the entity. Now we'll talk about difference between the previous gap that is AS21 and index 110. The first major difference is the scope. When talk about AS21, the whole concept of AS21 used to revolve around the concept of shareholding. That means if you are having 50% shareholding or more than 50% shareholding, you can call the subsidiary and if you are not having more than 50% share and are having less than 50% share, then you have to account for the investment. Can I say that? Okay. But when we talk about index, as the guest speaker also mentioned, index are more principally inclined. So they have introduced this concept of power without holding majority right. That means power without holding voting right. So we will discuss in future and talk about concept of purpose and design. That's why I cannot further elaborate in detail regarding this because it is a concept which is embedded in the concept of rights. So when I'm going to discuss the concept of rights, you'll automatically get an understanding of thorough clarity on the topic of purpose and design. So I quickly read this para and then we will proceed. Okay. So when I invest in investee's purpose and design are considered, that means when you have to understand that how what is the purpose of entity and how the entity is designed. It might be clear that investing is controlled by the means of equity instruments. So whether the first part that is, if it is not having any contextual agreement, it will be either controlled on the basis of shareholding, that is equity instruments that give the holder proportionate voting rights, such as ordinary shares in the investee. In case 
in the absence of any additional agreement that is if there are no contractual agreements present that alter decision making the assessment of control focuses on which party if any is able to exercise voting right sufficient to determine the investor is operating in financial activity that means entity is not having any contractual agreements and all the decisions regarding the relevant activities will be taken on the basis of the investor which is holding the largest share holding into the entity i will further elaborate on this when i discuss the concept of rights now we we'll talk about power so first of all let's recall what we have said discussed till now where you have control we have control have three elements concept of power variable returns and third concept is ability to influence the variable return now for the power is categorized into three more parts first part is first you have to assess purpose and design and then second part is you have to assess the these three parts existing rights now we have to first assess the existing rights then we have to first assess the current ability then the relevant activity that means it is although it is a equation but when you have to understand this equation that is provided you have to follow a bottom to top approach to understand this equation that is first you have to understand the concept of relevant rights then the relevant activity sorry then what are the relevant activities as per this 110 so is there any principle or a definition that makes the activity relevant to the entity or any the criteria that is prescribed under indias 110 then we'll come to current ability so when can i say that i have a current ability direct the relevant activity of a business so then we'll discuss the concept of current ability then we'll discuss the concept of rights that is when i can say that i have a rights that give me current ability to influence the influence and direct the relevant activities of the investor so let us quickly read some so have power over investor and investor must have existing rights that give it the current ability to direct the relevant activities to determine about whether investor has power depends on the relevant activities the with decisions about the relevant activities are made and the rights the investor and other party have in relation to the investor are considered now when talk about relevant activities in this 110 does not provide for any express definition or a criteria to an activity must to for an activity to be categorized as relevant activity to an entity rather it provides an illustrative list to judge whether the activity is relevant to a business or not now first of all that we have a general point that for many investor a range of operating and financial activities significantly affect their returns it means an investor might performing various activities that it that can affect its returns that it generates now second it depends upon the current ability of investor whether it able to direct or relevant activities so as i told you it is a bottom to top approach so it depends on the current then for, we first identify the relevant activities then we have to judge on the basis of current ability that whether i will able to direct the relevant activity or not so first of all let us have a look example at the list that was prescribed under indias 100 Then, also it is an elaborative one, but it's going to help us to understand the concept of current ability. So, first example of activities that, depending on the circumstances, can be relevant activities include but are not limited to. So, as I said, it is an illustrative list. First of all, manufacturing and purchase and selling of goods and services. Now, when I can say manufacturing, purchase and selling goods and services can be a most relevant activity to a business. Can you give me an example of an entity? For which a manufacturing, purchasing, selling of goods can be the most relevant activity. Give me, you know, and can you, you know, also give me on the basis of a particular category of industry, not a particular entity, but a particular segment, a particular market. Textile. Textile. Okay. Any other example? FMCG. Yes, absolutely correct example. That is FMCG. So when we talk about FMCG, there is a concept we have studied in eleven that is economics in concept of perishable goods. In FMCG, it is the concept of perishable goods that make the manufacturing, purchase, and selling of goods and services most relevant to the entity. If I take many much time to sell my goods and services, my risk it is a risk of getting perished. That means it is a it might be not be able to be able to utilize that. Possible that it is not in the usable form. Second, managing financial assets during their life. That means the asset management company. Give me the example of this. Third is selecting, acquiring, and disposing of assets. 
So I can say a leasing company. An example of the third point that is selecting, acquiring, and disposing of asset. That means the leasing company selects the asset, starts to acquire, then acquires it, and it is next nice activity disposing of asset. It not maintains or operates the asset in between as it leases it to another entity. But at the time of disposing, we have to at the time of settling the lease, we have to purely consider the fact regarding the disposing of the asset. Third, researching and developing new products and processes. Now, any research company or IT based company, for example, Wipro can be an example for this. That research and developing that is R and D. We can say the most relevant activity that affect the return. If they are able to generate a nice software that is going to help people in lot of ways, they will generate more return. If they are not able to do so, then will generate less return. And the last part is determination of funding structure obtaining a funding. That means a capital ventures or investment companies or financial consultants that determine the funding structure or obtaining the funding of an entity. Now, for the understanding the concept of current ability, now we we'll talk about the concept of current ability. The most of the people, you know, frame an idea that the word current ability means we should have that ability to direct the relevant activity at present. That means I have, I should have a inclusive right. अगर मेरे पास आज voting right है, तो मैं direct कर सकता हूँ. अगर voting right नहीं है, तो मैं direct नहीं कर सकता. But that is not how actually the concept of current ability works. So when you are judging current ability, you have to judge in respect of the event. That is when you are able to influence the relevant activity of the business. So let us have a look at this example. The investor has an annual shareholders meeting at which decisions to direct the relevant activities are made. That means an AGM is a moment, uh, as an event where the relevant activities will be influenced or directed. The next scheduled annual shareholders meeting is in six months. Okay. However, shareholders that individually or collectively hold at least five percent of voting right have right to change the existing policies over the relevant activities at a particular special meeting. Which is scheduled to take place in 30 days. Policies over the land at this can be changed only at a special or scheduled annual meeting. That means, except in these two circumstances, at the special meeting, a scheduled AGM, we cannot direct or change the land activities of the business. This includes the approval of material sales of asset, as well as the making or disposing of significant investment. So, it is telling us about the relevant activities regarding the investment. That is. The relevant activities, approval of material, sales of assets, and making or disposing of significant investments. Here, the investor has clear ability to direct the relevant activity, but at the AGM, but not at special meeting, as there is no relevant information provided regarding the proportion of shares held by investor. So, when I talk about you know ability to influence the decisions or relevant activities of a business, so by looking at, the, at this example, because the investor has a Shareholding in my investing. So can I say it? Obviously, it can influence the relevant activity as an AGM because there is no special criteria that is prescribed for someone to influence the relevant activity as AGM. But there is a particular criteria that is prescribed. That is the concept of holding at least five percent of voting rights to influence the relevant activities at a special meeting that is going to take place in thirty days. Now that means we have to judge the concept of current ability. In respect to the event that is going to happen in future, for which we are, in which we have to affect the relevant activities. Now, to give you thorough clarity on the concept of current ability, I will take three examples. They are not mentioned here, but the first example is, for example, if I am holding, I am holding a equity share, say, let's say 25% equity share or 30% equity share, and the condition says, say that at least 5% of voting rights are required for me to participate in this meeting. Can I say I have a present exercisable right for me to for that makes me eligible or that makes me able so that I can influence the relevant activities of the business at a special meeting? Okay, so in this example, I have a I have having the right conclusive right at the equity shares at present. That means I have a option to exercise that right at future also. But if I take the second example, that currently I am not holding any equity share in the company, but I have a forward contract. Let's say I have a forward contract to acquire 30% share. Now, all of you are aware of forward contract. What a forward contract is? So, there we have particular characteristic of forward contract. It is mandatory to exercise. That means you have not a you are not having an option. So, you, if you are entering a forward contract, then you must settle it in the prescribed limit. 
so if i let's say if i have a you know contact that is going to settle in 20 days and the meeting is scheduled to take place in 30 days so can i say i have a present right if i'm sitting in present and i have power contact that will settle in 20 days so can i say that i have a present right to influence the current activity present exercisable right right or i will get the present exercisable right at the end of the period of 20 days so you can say there are no existing existing right but am i am i having the current ability to influence or that is relevant activity am i having the current ability because the speed of settlement of the short contract is 20 days it is within the 30 days so if i look at the future sitting in the present that means when the meeting is going to happen in 30 days i will be holding the conclusion that it is equity share that is allow me to influence the relevant activities of the business no third example so let us make this class to you no know, quite interesting so let me take example of naman so as you all know naman is a very hard working article of kalani company so, now i will ask i will ask naman to name one be best friend from his batch <laughs> so naman has named lakshya so let us assume a situation okay now assume that naman is working hard in the office it is on a period of tax audit say assume so naman is working very hard you now working till late evening 7 hours 8 pm in evening and suddenly he, and one fine day as always he is working in the office and suddenly lakshya comes in the office dancing and giggling so you might be wondering why lakshya is dancing and giggling as naman was so naman asked him out of curiosity that when i am having a lot of pressure work pressure the whole firm is working and why you look so relaxed so why you so relaxed so now next lakshya tells naman that he has applied for a leave of 3 days and if the leave are approved so he is going to visit goa for his holidays now this makes naman more sad that on one side he is working very hard for the firm and other side lakshya is going to enjoy the holidays in goa so okay so lakshya leaves after telling this whole thing now naman is working again working hard in the office suddenly one of the partners notices lakshya from his cabin lakshya now notices daman from his cabin I'm sorry notices daman from his cabin and calls him in the cabin and the partner asked that whether you have performed any outstation assignment or not naman informs him that i am not performed so the partner offers him an outstation assignment so this makes naman happy that finally he will perform an outstation assignment Now, Naman, out of curiosity, asks the partner that where have to go. So, so the partner gives him that assignment is in Goa. This makes Naman more happy that he will be visiting. He will be visiting Goa, and although with working and doing the assignment, he is going to enjoy with luxury. So, let's say then he asks the partner that where when he has to leave for this outstation assignment. Assume that the partner partner gives him the timeline that you have the flight in tomorrow 10 p.m. Okay, so tomorrow 10 p.m. you have to catch the flight. For example, for this you have to reach the airport at 7 p.m. So okay, so Naman leaves. Now next day, for example, Naman gets and the Naman gets late to reach the airport and the flight leaves. Okay, so Naman is not able to. Naman is not able to catch the flight for Goa. So can I say when Naman was offered the outstation assignment, he had that current ability to board the flight for Goa. But when the incident happened that Naman was not able to reach the airport at time, he lost that ability to board the flight for Goa. But you no, know, Naman got very sad and started crying on the airport. <laughs> Suddenly, Lakshya arrives. and being a best friend he notices naman and consoles him then asks him that why are you crying naman narrates the whole incident and lakshya 
tell them that don't worry to take my flight ticket and board <laughs> my flight and board my flight that is scheduled in next two hours and you can carry forward for your off station assignment so can i say that daman has again got his current ability to board the flight to go and perform his off station audit so the final conclusion we can form from the example is possible that i may i may be eligible or currently able at a particular moment to realize the relevant activities but there might be a certain event that may take place between the period of when relevant activity has to occur and at present that may affect my status of currently ability then current ability so that is the concept now we'll talk about right now we are following a bottom to top approach as i said so first of all we discuss about relevant activities then we discuss about concept of concept of <laughs> concept of current ability now finally we are going to discuss the concept of concept of right concept of right so i can can i say that if i am a, have i am able to identify the relevant activity of the business and assess whether i have a current ability on the basis of whether the rights i am holding give me a conclusive right to exercise the current ability to exercise that the relevant activity i can say i have a power over the entity i can say i have a power over the entity so i can say power arises from rights so to have power in investor an investor must have existing rights that give the investor the current ability to exercise the relevant activity that is again the definition of power that is mentioned now a few examples of the right that either an individual or in combination given an investor power include a right in form of voting rights that is the most simple example now second right to appoint reassign or remove members of investors key management personnel who have the ability to direct the relevant activities c right to appoint or remove another entity that directs the relevant activities d direct the right to direct the investor to enter into or veto any changes or transaction for the benefit of investor and if there are any other rights or maybe other agreement agreements of any other nature that may affect the structure or the design of the entity now when we talk about concept of rights the concept of rights is divided into two categories one is substantive rights another one is protective rights now what is a substantive right a investor in assessing whether it has power considers only substantive rights relating to an investor investor held by investor and others for a right to be substantive the holder must have practical ability to exercise that right that means for a right to be substantive i have to i should have the ability to exercise that right it must not be a dummy right it is credit to me to be substantive rights also need to be exercisable exercisable when decisions about the direction of relevant activities need to be taken again i gave the namal lakshya example that means I, it is that means that whether i am able to exercise my right at present does not mean that i be able to exercise my right to direct relevant activity at the moment when the incident of direct relevant activity occurs that means that egm occurs that might be certain events that take place between those two events that may affect my right to example the substantive rights are rights that give power over an entity now another example are another example of rights is protective rights now to understand the concept of protective rights let me take two of you and again for my example so your name so ayush i am taking up example of ayush and person with a mother so let's say ayush is an employee in say one of the biggest banks say hdfc bank a very senior employee and say mother is a promoter of a very famous company say mj limited so mj limited is in need of funds of let's say 1000 crore and it approaches ayush for a hdfc limited for purpose of getting the loan so the management of hdfc limited assesses the requirement of mj limited and they form come, come to the resultant that they will be funding mj limited on the one condition that is mj limited has to appoint ayush 
as one of the board of directors in MG Limited. Now, the purpose of appointing Ayush as a board of director is solely to safeguard the interest. That means solely to safeguard the safety of regarding the repayment of interest and the principal of the loan that was provided by the ADFC Bank. So I wish, I feel not, I wish will not do and make any decisions regarding the direction of relevant activities. Examples of protective rights include again a lender's right to restrict a borrower from undertaking activities that could significantly change the credit risk of the borrower to the detriment of lender. Be the right of a lender to seize the assets of a borrower if the borrower fails to meet specified loan repayment conditions. Now, as you said, it is another concept that only substantive rights are considered while assessing the concept of power and no protective rights are assessed. Now we talk about substantive rights. They are further divided into two categories. That is power with majority voting rights, no power with majority voting rights, power without majority voting rights and then other substantive rights that is any other agreement that may give you the power over that entity. Now let us have a look at these three, what these three concepts of voting rights in detail. Now we talk about power with majority voting rights. An investor that holds more than half of the voting rights of an investee has power in the following situations. The relevant activities are directed by a vote of holder of majority of the voting rights. So when when the relevant activities are directed purely on the basis of the voting rights or a majority of members of governing body, the direct relevant activities are appointed by a vote of the holder of majority of voting rights. Now, majority of voting rights but no power. For an investor that holds more than half of the voting rights of the investee to have power over an investee, the investor's voting rights must be substantive and must provide the investor with the current ability to direct the relevant activity, which often will, will be through determining the operating and financial policies. And it may be possible that an investor does not have power on investee, even though the investor holds the majority of voting rights in investee. So when those investors on voting rights are not substantive. For example, an investor that has more than half of the voting rights in investee cannot have power if the relevant activities are subject to direction by government, court, administrator and receiver. That means although I am having majority voting rights, I don't have any control over the relevant activities of the business. Now, when we'll talk about power without a majority of voting rights, that is the most important aspect of substantive rights. An investor can have power even if it holds less than the majority of voting rights of an investee. An investor can have power with less than majority of voting rights of an investee, for example, through a contractual agreement between the investor and other vote holders. That is, although I'm having less than majority voting rights, there might be a contractual agreement that gave me a power to exercise my current ability to affect the relevant activities of the business. Second, rights arising from other contractual agreements. See the investor's voting rights. Now to understand the concept of investor's voting rights, give another example. Entity H, Entity H holds Entity H holds 45% shares in Entity S and remaining voting rights are held by thousands of other investors in aggregate. The AGM of Entity S is scheduled to take place in 30 days with agenda of appointing, removing, setting and remuneration of management responsible for directing the relevant activities of Entity S. And Entity S is willing to propose two options at AGM regarding this agenda. So Entity H holds 45% Entity S and the AGM is scheduled to take place in 30 days. Where the main relevant activity that has to be taken is setting the remuneration or appointing the management responsible for directing the relevant activities. Now, as for the policies of Entity H, Entity S, it requires minimum 50% votes in favor of any option for its approval. As H, Entity H holds a significant portion of voting rights in Entity S, it may not be possible for the investor to counter its decision making ability ability in event of directing the relevant activity related to Entity S. Entity H can be said to have power over Entity S. 
that means although ndt h is holding 45% share and there are 55% shares held by other owners ndt h has a significant influence influence over ndt s because other 55% stake can be divided into any you know dividing between the multiple owners that is thousands of shareholders so it may be very difficult for thousands of shareholders to form a you know a, say a conclusive opinion a common opinion to contradict with ndt h not the we have potential voting rights that may form a convertible debentures that means i have not have any voting rights at present but within the time period of present and the event relevant activity i have a conversion option that will give me a right to exercise my current ability to influence the event activity when the event happen now e is combination of and that means a contractual agreement and a potential voting right now we have example 3a that means we discuss the example 3 when we discussed in when we started with the concept of current ability that means an example where the agm was scheduled to happen in, in 6 months and special meeting in 30 days when investor holding 5% share will be able to influence the activity now take the example 3a if an investor holds the majority of voting rights in the investor the investor's voting rights are substantive because investor is able to make decisions about the direction of relevant activities and the need to be made the fact that it takes 30 days before the investor can exercise his voting rights does not stop the investor from having the current ability to direct the relevant activities in the moment share are acquired that means if i am sitting in present i have a majority shareholding in the investor as present that means i have exercisable rights at present now example 3b an investor is a party now the example that i have given you is of that the forward contract that is exercisable so that you can quickly read through this is para it is nothing new in this para so i will skip it okay example 3c now an investor is a party to forward contract to acquire 25% shares so let us assume an investor is not holding any shares or any right at present now it, it is holding only one right at the forward contract to acquire 25% shares and that is going to settle in 4 months so can i say that i have a rele- existing right to direct the relevant activity in the special meeting but whether i will be able to direct the relevant activities at the agm that is scheduled to happen in 6 months yes i have of course i will be able to exercise my right because there is no particular criteria that is defined to for a person to attend the agm so current ability is a static judgment not a flow judgment that means you have to reassess the current ability as soon as there is a change in any situation and even that occurs that affects the current ability you have that may be chances that your current ability to that relevant activity may change so final conclusion is can we then relevant activities it depends on our current ability and current ability arises from the existing rights now we we'll talk about returns now the second con- part of the definition of control is exposure to variable returns when assessing whether an investor has a control over invested the investor determines whether it is exposed or is rise to variable returns from involvement with the investor second an investor is expo, 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 exposed or has rise to variable returns from its involvement with the investor when an investor return from involvement have a potential to vary as a result of investor's performance the investor return can be only be positive only negative and negative also that means the returns must be variable they must not be constant but now we have looked this example to understand what we mean by the term variable so an investor holds a bond with fixed interest payments the fixed interest payments are variable return for the purpose of standard because they are subject to default risk that means whether the entity will able to pay the interest depends on how better it performs so the fixed interest payments are considered as variable returns for the purpose of this standard now the amount of variability depends on the creditors of the bond similarly fixed performance fees for many investors set as variable returns because they expose the investor to performance risk of the investor the amount of variability depends on the investor's ability to generate sufficient income to pay the interest interest or the fees now examples of returns include dividends or any distribution of economic benefits for example interest on debt security issued by the investor remuneration for servicing investors asset or liabilities returns that are not available to other interest 
holders. Now, uh, final part is ability to impact the investor's return. An investor controls the investee if the investor not only has power of the investee but has exposure to variable returns and ability to use his potential of power to affect his variable returns. Investor's return may get affected by the existing exercising his decisions, making authority in directing the relevant activities of the investee. Now, we have a case study on assessment of control. If A Limited holds 40% shares, shares in B Limited, a multi-seller conduit. B Limited issues short-term debt instruments to unrated third-party investors. The transition was marked to potential investors as an investment in portfolio of highly rated medium-term assets with minimal exposure to the credits associated with the possible default by the issuer of assets in the portfolio. So, without reading this example as a whole, let me give the understanding what this example says. Entity holds 40% shares in B Limited. And B Limited is a multi-seller conduit. That means it acts as a transmission agency. So they are and they are going to be third parties which are going to sell their portfolios to B Limited. And B Limited will market those portfolios on behalf of those investors to uh, outsiders. So outsiders on the, at the at the name of a fixed interest payment security asset, a highly medium term asset. They will market it as a highly rated medium term asset. So A Limited establishes of the conduit, several terms of conduit B Limited. Now it is talking about the power that is A Limited having over B Limited. And manages the operation of the conduit for a market based fees. The fee is commensurate with the services provided. A Limited approves the seller permitted to sell the conduit. That means outside seller which are going to sell the securities to the conduit are permitted by A Limited. And A Limited must act in the best interest of all investors. Now, A is entitled to a reasonable return from the conduit plus has also extended credit investment facility or a liquidity facility. So, can I say A limited is having, can I say the A limited is having control or power, control over B limited? So, yes, even though A limited is paid a market based fee for servicing the common state, is having the control over B limited because he is having first a contractual agreement that exercises him as powers him to direct the relevant activities of the business. And then he is also prone to variable returns from the receipt because he had issued a credit investment facility or security facility. And third, because of having holding these kind of substantive rights, he may take some kind of decision that may affect the variable returns of the entity. All the three conditions of control are satisfied. Yes, we can say that A limited is in control of the conduit that is B limited. So that was said from my side.